Hello, friends. This is an episode many of you have been waiting for. We're talking about the great Malenko. And uh, we want to give a shout out. I want to give a shout out to Jay for set, telling the Michigan Juggalos to vote for Biden because he had a decisive victory in that state. We're not trying to get into politics. I know some of you maybe didn't vote for Biden. It's all good. But I've never heard ICP go officially endorse a candidate for president. And it was on their, um, what they did a Wednesday, a podcast Wednesday snacks where they mentioned him. Yeah. One of their Monday or Wednesday episodes where they were just talking about a certain subject. I forget which one they mentioned at the very end. Violet J says vote to, for Biden because his mom will kill us if we vote for Trump. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what's up. Um, snacks. How you been, dude? I've been good, brother. No complaints here. Like you said, I've been waiting a long time for this episode. Can you believe that we're on the great Malenko? So this is my favorite record of all time. And uh, I I've, I've picked up a, this vinyl copy. It came out on Record Store Day in 2017 at the Nashville Country Music Hall of Fame in the gift shop. They had it. I was like, yo. And I had a day off. I was on tour with Cuckoo Kangaroo. And then that, that night, we went to see Coco at the movie theater. And I had this fresh vinyl with me. And I brought it home from tour. And I, and, and, and I didn't realize now it's like, like Riddlebox. It goes for a lot of money on Discogs. Like it's rare. They didn't print a lot of these. But the pressing is great. The uh, yeah, the, here I'll I'll pull out the record is um, it's red, so they look really fresh. That's so and dope. The mastering is awesome. I mean, it's this is a great great record. And um, snacks you have the, on CD, right? The original Island pressing on CD. Yes, I do indeed. And uh, this is the green one. Uh, you know, a lot of juggalos know they came out with a couple of different colors: green, red, purple. Uh, and this was the the first copy of Malenko I ever bought. And uh, like you said, man, what a masterpiece, right? And so I was wondering, I was always wondered, like having the multiple color colored covers, certain jugglers probably tried to buy all of them and that helped this become a platinum record in a way, right? Yes. Multiple editions. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first example of them doing that kind of tactic. And I, I'm, I think if you put, uh, if you got all the colors and you put the liner notes together, you'd get the name of the... Um, uh, next Joker's car, Jekyll Brothers. Oh, really? Like, like how? Like on the back or yeah, what? Yeah, let me take a look here because I got uh, my liner notes here real quick. While I'm pulling these out, I'll just mention that <clears throat> it was released June 24th, 1997. And again, August 12th, 1997. And we're, of course, going to go to get into why there is two release dates within a couple of months of each other. So yeah, this is the green one. <clears throat> and you, as you can see, one that's really dark, but uh, one of the liner notes just has a section of some text that says, will be, and all it says is K-E-L bros. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I'm almost positive that the uh, different colors, all the different colors would give you the message. Okay, so in 1994, a famous wrestler named Boris Malenko died the father of joe and dean malenko and um his nickname was the great malenko so we'll talk about this but this was something mega Rand pointed out to me that i always you know i don't know much about wrestling i've learned a lot more through my love of icp and um so the great malenko has this kind of vaudevillian wrestling reference but jay says it was kind of subconscious and and unintentional that's interesting that malenko had died in, in 94 and they were working on this record you know a few years after that so maybe it was on their mind as as wrestling marks i think so and uh, you know it, it will happen again too with, with the missing link because there is a wrestler named the missing link so uh you know i i definitely think whether subconsciously or not icp's wrestling love is gonna shine through that's what's up. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so this album was produced by Mike E. Clark, and their A and R Julian Raymond was at Jive, right? And he was a juggalo, and he was riding for them. And I'm sorry, not at Jive, at um, Hollywood Records. Excuse me. Yeah. And so he, w they, they were like, okay, well, you know, this guy can help us. We've got the Disney money. That's not going to be an issue. And they were really excited to work with him because they felt like he understood them um so julian raymond on the re-release produced a song with them right the, what was it the storm song or something about blizzard yeah black blizzard yeah and it's interesting that they reconnected him with them on that we'll do an episode about the re-release another time but they they uh julian and icp stayed friends for years so let's talk about the recording info oh yo you got it there holler yes sir Ooh. 
Super which also has the sh- shockumentary DVD. Yes, and, and, and bonus spells. I think is the is the name of that bonus disc with the Black Wizard, which has like Witching Hour and a lot of like fresh songs from that era that are classic and outtakes and stuff. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the artists that Hollywood was able to pay to get on this record. And when I talk about ICP and I try to be like getting people excited about them, I'm like, Yo, Malenko has all these guests. <laughs> they bridge they bridge guests with metal and punk and and all this stuff, which was unique. They had didn't, before that had been all like Isham, Kid Rock, local people. Um, so who's on this record, Snacks? Let's go. For sure. So, uh, you know, three of the big ones that come to mind are Alice Cooper on the intro. Uh, you got Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols on Piggy Pie. And, of course, Slash of uh, Guns N' Roses fame uh, on Halls of Illusion. And like you said, you know, that's super cool and interesting. I mean, Alice Cooper... I mean, he's he's talks on the intro, but the guitar I always thought was like interesting because it's not like rapping where like a collab you're gonna know who the feature is just by listening to it. Like, I, and I didn't know that these like famous musicians were playing guitar until like probably months or years later. I read it after hearing the album, uh, but like you said, <clears throat> they they uh, did this for exposure and kind of mimicked what ICP did in their early career, breaking into the Detroit scene, getting like Kid Rock and Isham on uh, Carnival Carnage. Uh, the Hollywood record label wanted to do that on like a basically a national version, getting those big names for exposure. Yeah, and it kind of like, there was this, it was pre-rap metal, pre-Limp Bizkit, Corn had happened. And so the idea that you could have metal with rap was kind of like they were on the wave of that aesthetically. And also something I wanted to mention, um, when I did True Player For Real, I had one of my heroes, my musical hero, Weird Al, play accordion on it. And it's a similar thing, because I was like, yo, I thought about that, how ICP had Slash and Steve Jones playing instruments on the record. And I'm like, in a way, that's kind of doper, because this person is anonymously being involved in kind of a more back, like, you know, from the shadows kind of backing up in a way. So, like, that was always, like, my idea of getting Al to play accordion on that was, in a way, a tribute to this. That but, you dope. know, that's what's up. Keep, completely different and like um just fun when music crosses equally over as collaboration fresh, equally as fresh thank you snacks <laughs> shout out to weird al good person okay so um so okay they recorded most of the tracks at mikey clark studio which is now called the fun house so let me ask you something snacks other than alice cooper's parts recorded in phoenix did they record any parts in L.A.? And was Shaggy able to be at these sessions? <laughs> Great question. Uh, they did record uh, all the guest features in L.A. Besides, like you mentioned, Alice Cooper. And Shaggy did not attend the L.A. recording sessions because he did get arrested uh, pretty much immediately before they were set to leave. Uh, and he got a heavy-duty jail sentence for driving on a suspended license. He was sentenced to a year. Uh, but as uh, Violet J states in Behind the Paint, the Dark Carnival wasn't having that. Uh, and some local watchdog groups uh, put pressure on the judge to reduce the sentence to 45 days. But he still missed all that L.A. flavor. And famously, Jay didn't feel like waking up to go to the session with Steve Jones. Because <laughs> I guess he's, they weren't, they maybe had heard the Sex Pistols, but they weren't super like big fans, right? Yeah, they, so, Violet J had no idea what he was going to say to him. So he just told Julian to tell uh steve jones he was sick a few years ago steve jones was doing a book signing in new york um at strand bookstore and i really i was planning to go to ask him like questions about what that session was like but i have to report that i didn't know what to say to him (laughs) so i didn't go but i was like gonna totally go and ask him and he you know other than sex pistols he worked with x he worked with a lot of like bands like steve jones was very prolific um and uh yeah it's 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 really i think that 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 riff on piggy pie is cool because it's not really it's like a thrash riff but it's kind of a metal riff and um we'll get into all the music let's talk about okay there's a lot of stories from behind the paint we can gloss over so when they got the million dollars for signing to hollywood records what did they do with that cheddar that scooter that cheese for sure. The first thing they said they, they always said they would do when they got some significant money, which is buy a wrestling ring. As we were talking about before, huge wrestling marks. Um, so that's what they did. And they also got a warehouse in Novi, Michigan, where they had this wrestling ring and, and an office in the same building. And they would host these uh, weekly or uh, bi-weekly wrestling shows of their old wrestling 
federation they used to have as kids, NAW. And Violent J just describes this as an amazing time, you know, reliving those memories as, you know, uh, successful rappers on a, you know, major label. Everything seemed to be groovy uh, leading up to the release of Malenko. So let me ask you this. Were there, was there ever a show when any members of Radiohead were kicked out of the dressing room trying to introduce themselves? <laughs> yes. So <laughs> there's a story with uh, Tom York of Radiohead echoing a similar story that they have of, uh, you know, Jive Records CEO uh, in which Tom York uh, tries to uh, enter the bathroom as ICP are putting on their paint. Billy Bill, uh, you know, keeps him from entering, says you can't enter right now. ICP don't like being seen while putting the paint on. Uh, Tom York insisted, and apparently things got pretty <laughs> physical. And uh, I highly recommend for anybody who hasn't uh, to listen to the audiobook version so they can hear Violet J tell that story and do his impeccable English accent. <laughs> and when Jay did a backflip off of the speaker stack, did he ever have to go to the hospital during this time? Yes, he did. He uh, got uh, uh, he broke his collarbone in uh, four places and also got a uh, concussion. And he, but worse than all this, he seems to be traumatized by the fact that they had to cut his shirt off, uh, and he does not like being seen without his shirt on. And that's how he knew he, without his shirt off, sorry, with his shirt off. And that's how he knew he was uh, out cold because he wouldn't let it happen otherwise. Um. Okay. So. The Box was a music request service where later Twisted's We Don't Die would be a big hit. And um, uh, it was a place where Juggalo music could be requested where you'd call in. So what music video was celebrated on this channel, Snacks? Great question. Halls of Illusion. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure the way it's told in Behind the Paint, like that, that music video was out before Malenko. Um, and uh, it was being requested flat out. Uh, and, uh, you know, was just being played constantly. So that was another good sign ICP felt that they were really going to take things to the next level. Well, speaking of, speaking of Malenko, before it was released, did Julian have to ask them to change any lyrics or remove any songs? Because when I was looking at the Hollywood release and the Island release, I noticed there were some differences. For sure. Uh, big differences. Uh, you know, uh, Julian Raymond actually flew to Detroit in person to tell them the stale news shortly, uh, you know, before the album was set to come out, that they had to change some lyrics, uh, well, a lot of lyrics, and they had to take off three songs, uh, Under the Moon, um, The Ned and Game, and Boogie Woogie Woo. Uh, they went back and forth for, you know, quite a while on if they should cave, if they weren't. Hollywood was actually ready to shelf the record entirely. So ICP went back into the studio, made some changes, left a lot of the lyrics the same, uh, did take off the three songs, and when they passed it through, even though a lot of lyrics remained unchanged, I, uh, Violet J states that they, they didn't uh, notice the things that didn't change, and they put the second version through. I mean, that's the thing. Like When you have a major big company like that, sometimes it's like, people don't pay attention there's so much stuff coming through a big label like that and um that's interesting was that was that where they would change like they changed some of the lyrics to be like piggy pie he says bucket instead of shotgun yeah. and stuff like that like they make they use ghetto slang right that's exactly so right. they made yeah. some changes that's what's up okay so hollywood puts out the record instantly everything's fine right or does anything go wrong <laughs> Well, so the infamous story is that, uh, you know, within hours of it being released, Hollywood actually pulls the record suddenly. Um, and ICP hear about this at an in-store. Once again, Julian Raymond approaches ICP uh, with their manager, Alex Abyss, who looks totally dismayed and states uh, that, uh, you know, the record is pulled. The tour that they had scheduled to uh, promote the record is canceled, as is the in-store tour that they were currently doing at that time. Um, and uh, this led to a big debacle. And I'll let you take it from here to explain some of that flavor. Well, part of it was that um, the Southern Baptist Coalition was was a protesting Disney because they had a day at Disneyland or Disney World where uh, same-sex couples could come with their families. And the Baptists were like, we're not feeling that, you know? And um, obviously now, you know, that pressure would, could never happen on a company like Disney because Disney's a lot more, you know, progressive and 
like you know they wouldn't care but anyway and so they were like okay so what how can we take the heat off oh we have this band with um you know albums that look like this and we can't you know stand behind it so they dropped it but guess what alex abbas being the great manager he is and i would say this is the greatest thing he ever did for icp he contacted the la times to say we've been censored by a media company because of this it's a violation of our free speech which you know yeah i mean companies have the right to like artists labels drop artists every day hundreds of artists are dropped every day and signed and so it really isn't much of a story on that alone, but but he was able to spin it in a way to, that worked to their advantage. And so they were going to go. He gave them money. He said, "Go on vacation." And then he's like, "Guess what? There's a there's a ton of people want to talk to you." And like this is the reason why any anyone is still talking about ICP because it led to mainstream exposure, ticket sales, money, which was able to keep the machine going. If that hadn't happened, if they, if that, if Alex hadn't made that call, we would not be talking about ICP right now. They probably would have maybe not done Jekyll brothers, or if they did, it would have been on psychopathic and only come out regionally. That's you know? right. Yeah, so. I, I agree. It, it would have definitely changed the fate of insane clown posse. Uh, so, so much. And I remember I had a, we, we used to carpool and um, with these kids and they, these, these kids who, you know, definitely more into ICP music or stuff like that. And they were talking about how they'd seen it on MTV. They'd heard about it. Oh, did you hear about this band that got dropped? And I was like, wow, everyone's talking about this, you know, like it became national news. And so, um, anyway, so when they were recording Alice Cooper's parts and Jay was trying to explain the dark carnival to the master of horror metal, who, by the way, trivia about Alice Cooper. I don't know if you knew this, Alice Cooper, he was signed and, um, mentored by Frank Zappa on his Bizarre label. I don't know if you knew Alice Cooper is a Frank Zappa um, artist. Did no, you know that? I, I did not know that. So he discovered him. So anyways, he's trying to explain Alice Cooper. Was Alice Cooper stoked about this? <laughs> did he care about the Dark Carnival? What's up? So that's one of the cool things about the book version of Behind the Paint, the audiobook version of Behind the Paint, because uh, Violet J kind of like concedes a little bit more. I think he's a bit more, you know, open with certain details. Because in the, the book, he talks about how after I, uh, Violet J explains, you know, the whole Joker's card mythology, Alice Cooper is really digging it. But in the book, he's reading that exact part and then he stops at that like part where he says he's re re really digging it and he says he honestly didn't give a bleep <laughs> and so so on and so forth but in both versions Vala J states that somewhere in his golf addled mind quote unquote he got the uh, mythology and schooled the intro which he did because it's so fresh um that is funny. He talks about how he looked like a witch, a, a, a preppy witch. I always thought that was funny with his golf clothes. Yeah. I went to I went to high school in um, a town called Pebble Beach, and um, we were, and you know, it was on a famous golf course, the Pebble Beach Golf Course. And every year they'd have the AT and T um, golf tournament, and it would be like right on, basically like right. You go, you could go to class and then leave class and go watch the golf tournament, and. Um, Alice Cooper would be there playing. And I remember thinking about that, thinking about how he had recently, like a year or two before, done the Great Malenko intro. And there he is, like in the backyard of my high school playing golf. I never went and met him, but I'd love to have him sign the Great Malenko. I should have done that. That's dope. Anyway. It's dope that you can also, like, back up the whole Alice Cooper's obsession with golf. <laughs> yeah, that's the irony about him, and that he was a businessman who was able to make this character. You know, he's very smart. Like yeah. in Wayne's world, remember, he's like, he talks about, well, Milwaukee comes from the Native American land of the, I forget what he says, but he's like telling all this, <laughs> dropping all this smart <laughs> knowledge. Yeah. Um, I seen him live actually. And it, it was a crazy concert. The actor call in a similar way to ICP. Yeah, absolutely. I only remember it's, Feed My Frankenstein because that's like one of the only songs I know by him. But I remember that yeah. moment being fresh. You know, his best song, I think, is called Poison. It's I always wanted to sample that. It's about it's about a toxic love, so to speak, ICP. Um, also, I, don't, I just thought of this. So the label that Zappa signed Alice Cooper to was called Bizarre. And that would be the Joker's card that came out uh, before the Wraith. Or not Joker's card, this the this the sideshow double album. I wonder if ICP had ever like looked at Alice Cooper's first album and said, Oh, that'd be a good name for an album. Look at that label. I don't know. That's just a random thought. <laughs> Purely speculation, as they say. 
Okay, so let's talk about the um, Arabic text in the liner notes because you did some good good research on this snacks, and I think you should drop this flavor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, actually, our homie Hans of uh, the Joker's Gallery um, uh, let us know this, and uh, I I always wonder what the the Arabic text is, uh, but a lot of juggalos will remember in the liner notes there is a line of Arabic text, and Hans uh, told us that it uh, says. Um, I, I believe it says something to the effect of like four after four drop two more will follow or something like that, which is a message mentioned in the album itself. But it's cool that they put it in the liner notes. They actually got a translation and put it in the liner notes. This is something interesting too. Like the um, pre-Muslim Arabic Empire stretched all the way from like Spain and North Africa to India at the height of the empire, and so. It's interesting, like the Egyptian, the Egyptian, um, you know, imagery and everything. It kind of it's like re- reflective of this like timeless sorcerer from another era, and I think it's really cool how they use that stylistic element of the Arabic text, which you know, Egyptian and Arabic, different cultures, but similar geography, and the empires are both like old school, early civilization. So it kind of gives Malenko this timeless, interesting. Um, imagery which i think which is kind of cool and malenko being the character who gives you an illusion so for example like the in in uh halls of illusions i always thought by the way i also thought that song should have been called halls of illusion because it's like the halls define this adjective of what they are versus halls of illusions i always felt like halls of illusion was a tighter name but you know that's their song it's it's all good but i always thought i for years i would always write it as halls of illusion but it's halls of illusions like these people who are doing horrible things beating their wives beating their kids but thinking that they're actually doing a good job and i think that's kind of a metaphor for like a lot of evil is very pernicious when you think you're doing the right thing for example there's this book about the banality of evil, which talks about how during the Holocaust, you know, not to, it's totally different worlds and not to make inappropriate connections, but like evil in general is when good people do nothing. If they just check the forums to order the gas, you know, to kill people or, or order the trains to come pick people up, doing the evil stuff that where you can then say, oh, well, I didn't do that. Like, I'm not responsible, you know, like I'm just doing my job cops killing killing people on the street who are innocent right i'm just doing my job that is when you create an illusion for yourself that you are actually doing the right thing and i think in a way it's one of icp's most pernicious villains in the in of the joker's cards are reflecting of a human evil because like it's something it's an evil that doesn't really get acknowledged and there's references to this character throughout we're going to dive into the songs but i think it's worth talking about that and how egyptian mythology has a, is a lot about magic and the egyptian book of the dead and like when you die ways to you know s- survive and go on to the next life like all these mystical elements so it's it's just very i don't know i think very well thought out and sometimes the joker's cards and the imagery and the morality doesn't really connect and feels a little jimmied together this is an example where it feels like it does fit. Yeah, so, I agree. Right? ICP can be really good at that, even if they're not like scholars as far as like different cultures and stuff. Like you said, they can kind of like amalgamate things and 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 present this overall vibe. And uh, I agree. You know, Malenko is just like one of the best examples of them schooling that. And in the intro, um, the, uh, the 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 thing that they're reading that Jumpsteady wrote is very much like Dungeons and Dragons. The ancient realms of necromancy and all this stuff is very straight out of Dungeons and Dragons. So it has that kind of nerdy role-playing game flavor, which I think is dope. Oh yeah, I think it's interesting that the album starts out there like in a country bar Mm -hmm. and it's like, put some music on, I feel like dancing. And then then the record goes into Alice Cooper and and, and they punch it and and he goes, oh, don't worry, that happens all the time. That's a very funny way to start the record. Like all the time, this weird Alice Cooper demonic voice comes on the jukebox that's very funny it's probably their funniest introductory skit yeah i i agree it is just, it's it's super icp like they do stuff like that all the time like it reminds me in a way of like um uh is it suicide is the name of the song suicide hotline on hell's pit where he's like you know the whole song is him talking to like a guy like a, a crisis line saying he's gonna kill himself and at the end he gets a like a beep from his girlfriend and like he's all good tells him to come over like icp yeah. just have a huge way of you know building something up super serious and then spinning it to kind of make it humorous in a, in a way that only they can do 
Well, humor, grid humor is the juxtaposition of expectation, right? Yeah. And I think ICP has always played with this. You think they're going to be funny. You think they're going to be scary. You think <clears throat> juxtaposition of music, like, you're right. That's a that's a central, like, element, of especially this record. The Great Malenko, the song, is I feel like that song, you know, that song was like a lot of people... I remember I used to play it on my, I had a radio school show in high school and I'd play that song and kids would get into it and they'd be, oh, that's tight. And then they buy the record. They're like, oh, I don't know. I'm not really feeling it. It's not, it's not Sugar Ray. It's not this or that. But like as an introduction, it makes you want to know more. And it's, um, they're just going back and forth, talking, not rapping, kind of like Public Enemy. And um, yeah, it's tight. It's yeah, tight. it's my, it's actually, I can say definitively, it's my favorite self-titled Joker's Card song. That's what's up. I would agree. I would agree too. Hocus Pocus is themed on the carnival magic um, element. There's a calliope, which is the instrument, which does the um, the sound, and that's like a circus organ, which is like very like a really cool idea. So, did George Clinton speak on this track? Let's go. <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, there's a part in the song uh, that you know, Violent J is going clown dog. Freak dog, which doesn't sound bad, but I did always kind of wonder why it's there, and it made much more sense uh, when I read the book Behind the Paint, where Violent J talks about how they originally tried to get George Clinton to do that part. It was for George Clinton, but they didn't like the vocal takes, so they ended up uh, redoing it themselves. And the music is a is a famous Arabian riff that they interpolated. There's two samples. That we also want to talk about that you meant you found snacks. So um, there's sample from Scarface and there's a sample from Buzzsaw by the Turtles. And check it out. De La Soul famously put out a record where they sampled the Turtles and the daughter of one of the members of the Turtles was playing the De La Soul record and he didn't realize they'd sample them. So we sued them for like a million dollars. De La Soul and Three Feet High and Rising had this whole legal issue, which is why that album is not on Spotify and most of De La Souls because a member of the Turtles' daughter <laughs> heard them on this classic rap record. So I, I bet they sam they cleared this Buzzsaw sample. It's a popular hip hop sample. Like I know like D-Nice, I think. Like my name is D-Nice. I think that this is uh -huh. the same sample too, but it's faster. And uh, X-Clan sampled it on one of their Suburban Noise releases. It's a super dope bass line. There's also that, um, what is that? The uh, uh, is that that did 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 literally that's the um that's the march of the gladiators i think that song's called entry of the gladiators did that's a famous circus one and also that the there's a there's a place in france yes. did, 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 did. so it's all these famous earworms yeah exactly. that are in hocus pocus right yeah so it's kind of genius in that way it is holler all right so let me ask you this snacks are there any like fairy tales that they did a violent version of for this <laughs> yes, record? Let's th go. There is uh, Steve Jones. The song that Steve Jones is on, "Piggy Pie," uh, takes a spin on Three Little Pigs, in which ICP enacts some vigilante justice on uh, three different people: a redneck, um, a judge, and a rich person. And uh, done in ICP, you know, violent, uh, almost cartoonishly so. Uh, manner and it you know classic to this day uh i mean this album is just going to be classic after classic but this song in particular is like you know just an absolute juggalo anthem and then we have the suicidal teen being taunted in the skit after played by mikey clark and there were many skits that weren't used later that are on the malenko uh 20th anniversary but he calls and it's it's a, it's it's kind of a dark but funny thing where jay's just taunting him and yeah. Holler. Okay, how many times? Now, this is like Jay's solo song. I think the video for this is really cool. And he talks about, you know, it feels like it's Groundhog's Day where he talks about everything is repeated, every day is the same, nothing gets better. And it, I think he shows like his real, real anger. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and it just makes me think about, I don't know, it makes me, it's, it's, it's definitely one of their best songs. It shows a serious political side. And it's interesting to hear him in normal situations, going to the DMV, going into his car and the glass has been broken. Like it, yep. it humanizes them in a way where they're out of this fantasy world and it's channeling real anger. And is there, what is the other story? Is there um, the line about the judge who defy, how many times must a judge decide my fate? Right. Who is he? A blank, nothing great. So, and so this goes back to like this long era 
of 18th century satire. Jonathan Swift and Gulliver's Travels, which y'all probably know is a story where this guy goes into an island of little people, then he goes to an island of giant people. Jack Black played it in a recent remake. But there's a character where there's a judge who is, he satirizes who they have to decide what to do to Gulliver, right? And Jonathan Swift parodies the legal system of these people who are these the tiny people who decide that their lives mean so much and they have to like make um make fate for for this for this person and it's funny about how relative even when people are small they feel like their power is infinitely strong so i feel like that's a reference to the jonathan swift um theme if not a direct reference i thought it was an interesting connection Absolutely. okay then we go into, oh, and also it ties into this idea of like, what's the practical, it's, I mean, I might not agree with this, but like, what's the practicality of a liberal arts education? What's the practicality of understanding science and chemistry? And this, people might, you know, they cite them as being anti-intellectual, anti-education. It's this thing that's all, they're always lampooned about in the miracles about making fun of magnets. But uh, this always struck me as like this willful ignorance of, okay, yes, if you, if you understand chemistry, you can't go into McDonald's and say you can, that limestone and gunpowder have a similar origin. But guess what? If you know that, maybe you can get a job where you can therefore afford McDonald's because you value education and value the time. So I don't know. I, I, I always kind of disagreed with that stance. I see where he's coming from and it's kind of funny, but it's also like, I felt like it's this willful ignorance. I have a line in, um, what is it? Schrodinger's cat. I say juggalos are criticized for lacking PhDs, which is kind of, I, it's, there's an anti-intellectualism in juggalo culture, but that doesn't define it. And no. it's not always there. But this song is like a, an example of that. Um, and I understand like, you know, student loans and all that stuff is expensive. And some people don't have the same opportunities that people who've gone to college have. But that doesn't mean you have to like say that science and knowledge is use useless. And I, I wonder if Jay and Shaggy would still agree with that line, still stand by it, you know, making fun of knowledge because, yeah, whatever. Well, I it's heard something that I disagree the, with about that. There's a sequel on, on Yum Yum Bedlam called Learn to Code. Really? No, I'm <laughs> just joking. I wouldn't be surprised about that because he talks, they rap about, <laughs> they rap about, that's a pretty funny joke snacks. They rap about, you know, he raps about gaming on streaming on Twitch and stuff. Like they stay kind of relevant. That's funny. Holler. I wonder, I wonder if JJ will go to college, right? Or like if Ruby will go to college, what would Jay say about that? Because Eminem's daughter went to University of Michigan. So when you have a generation of artists who can then afford to give their kids those opportunities, what happens? For I don't sure. know. I've heard, <laughs> well, I've heard Father Jay say two things on the subject. He has said that like his kids' college are paid for in the event that they want to go to college. But I've also heard yeah. him say that if it wasn't for their mom, <laughs> he wouldn't be able to make them go to school because he doesn't believe that much in you know school in general i guess because from his experience it didn't do much from him for him but i think he's definitely if they want to go to college for whatever they aspire to i think he's definitely open to that holler everyone everyone's story is different and there's not just one way of living life that's and, right um, yeah that's what's up but here's the irony as much as they like talk about you know education and criticize th those institutions their stuff is educational and yes, they might mispronounce words. And yes, they might, you know, talk about like it. What is it on Jekyll Brothers? He goes, he talks about the years later. I want my blank. He goes 300 years later, but it's 200, like some simple stuff that they mess up, but that's okay yeah. because it's still educational. And, and like, you know, I don't know, we're in an era where truth and new and news are becoming relevant again. And so I think it's worth pointing that out. Let's keep it moving. I could talk about this all day. Southwest. <laughs> oh, before let's talk about the suburban gangster skit. Yes. Super cool, cool. <laughs> skit that uh, we're like, you know, these these kids are at this this other kid's house, you know, basically talking about being initiated into a gang. You know, and this this kid is telling um, these initiates like how like hardcore he is and stuff and then his mom you know calls out to him and says like you got to do your homework and everything so he's like you know i'll meet you guys tomorrow after school oh no wait a minute i got your book uh just pointed out the fact that he's you know basically a poser who icp have you know i'm sure seen a lot of when they were growing up and in a sense they've admitted to being themselves even though they were in some you know heavy duty you know violent stuff they weren't like a as inner city posse they weren't a gang who were like profitable like moving guns or selling drugs or anything like that yeah um 
also, it's interesting how later, like a skit like this, Twisted would be doing a lot of the voices. Jamie Madrox, who's the master of characters, would do all the different characters. He does a lot of the skits on Jekyll Brothers, but this, it's them doing the characters. And you can hear how, like, between this and the later records, how much uh, their collaboration on the skit, specifically with Twisted, was, like, cool to give new characters. Southwest Voodoo. All right, this is such a great song. And Hoodoo... Hoodoo, running from my magic. He would, Big Hoodoo would reference this on a later song, which I think is tight as heck. Um, Southwest Voodoo. All right, so the sample is Brother J on X-Clan's Tribal Jam. You noticed that? Shout out to you, Snacks. And it sham- sam- samples a line from I'm Not Alone. What's the line it samples from Shaggy Solo Record? Um, I make a voodoo doll out of you and fling your uh, expletive. That's what's up. Um, I thought that it's kind of cool because it's, you know, I'm a big Shakespeare mark, whatever. And from Macbeth, there's this famous scene where the witches are trying to figure out what's going to happen with Macbeth and they're throwing stuff in the cauldron, an eye from a newt, whatever, a tail from a crow. And that's become such part of popular culture. You see that everywhere. And whether ICP know they're specifically referencing Macbeth, that becomes the pre-chorus, head from a newt. And a little itty bitty bitty drop of fago. It's like a tight way to do a twist on that trope. Um, Agreed. Yeah. I did not know that was from Shakespeare. I figured it was like from some Disney movie. So again, the lit hop knowledge has schooled me and I'm sure it was going to school a lot of viewers. That's what's up. And also, but everyone's used that, right? King yes. Arthur, the Black, the Black Cauldron specifically, uh, Perdane Chronicles, holler, we don't need to get into that, but that's the, that's, a, that's a trope. Okay, Southwest Voodoo being like a funny play on, um, obviously, Southwest Detroit. I had a friend, my friend Sean, who was the singer in my first band, he did a report on like African voodoo from Southwest Africa, and he called it um, Southwest Voodoo was the name of his essay, and we all thought that was so funny. That is, that's dope. <laughs> <laughs> the end the end they have the skit of the fabulous Fritz brothers yes. where it's like ooh ah then the guy gets dropped and dies um that screaming that he does is the exact same screaming samples Weird Al uses on his Jurassic Park song from Alapalooza where the guys get eaten by the T-Rex that ah if you listen to the end of Southwest Voodoo and Weird Al's Jurassic Park y'all will know that's some deep knowledge Wait. dropped Weird Al references twice yeah, hell Twice. yeah, man. I actually got that. That's the only physical CD I have of Weird Al. That's such a good... Man, Frank's 2000 Are you TV. serious? Yeah. Yeah, that's that was the first record that came out after I'd already discovered him. That was like, oh, it's a new Weird Al record. Word. And I remember I saw it at the store. I was so excited. It came out the day, came out the day before my birthday in 1993. Holler! <laughs> Facts! And that was the first concert I ever went to was that tour. Oh. Holler. All right, Halls of Illusions. We kind of talked about this. Um... In the music video, they recreate the carnival ride. ICP has often said they don't like when people try to manifest their vision of the dark carnival, but it's actually a really good video. Uh, 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 Slash wanted to be in it. He didn't end up being in it. I think the video is great. I think it's probably one of their best videos. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Is that much, what more? What more can we say about Halls of Illusions? Not much, really. Just you know, it's a uh, uh, carnival attraction. We're uh, a dark carnival attraction, really. The people go to and they can see what their lives could have been, uh, but wasn't because they messed it up with their misdeeds. Also, I think it's worth mentioning, guess who's next? It's Mr. Clark, the dirty old man from the trailer park. I always thought that was a shout out to Mikey Clark. <laughs> Mr. Clark, right? I thought that was a funny... I don't know. When I heard the producer's Mikey Clark, I was like, oh, Mr. Clark, right. the dirty old man from the trailer park. Also, uh, check it out. Um, there, and there's that that bridge where he talks about... Um, in the bridge where he talks about they're going to go to hell, but we can't... The bus is too full. They do this interesting descending scale on the guitar, and it resolves to a major chord when they talk about how when the truth is revealed. But we'll still cut your neck out. How's that? So it's if you listen to the musicality on the bridge, it goes down, it descends like like falling to hell, and then it resolves with a major chord. I always thought that was tight because I don't know musically. I make notes like that because it's like things that help tell the story musically, and that's probably Slash's idea for the composition because sure. he wanted I'm to know go what back the song and was about. To that dude, right after this, because that sounds dope, and I didn't pick up on that like as explicitly all the times I've heard that song. Yeah, but we'll still cut your neck out. How's that? Or and then and then the radio edit. You can still take the express route. How's that? Also, it's funny that Jay was stoked to have my, uh, Slash on this because he knew he played on Michael Jackson's Black or White. <laughs> yeah. So that's what's up. Under the Moon, man. I don't know. We've all like being a high schooler and having a crush for the first time on someone and then feeling like kind of ignored or ugly or nerdy. 
is painful. And this idea of like carrying, it's like th what they talk about a torch song. That's a song where you sing for a lost love. You hold a torch, a candle for them, hoping they'll return like a beacon. Like example, Pete's Dragon, the song I'll Be Your Candle on the Water. That's an example of a torch song. So he's holding this torch for this girl. Uh, he loves her. She's a sexually assaulted. He kills the dude. And then he goes to jail and she's not trying to mess with him because he's a murderer, even though they loved each other. I mean, it's such a gra graphic crazy song and jay talks about how it was the last song on side one of the cassette so the hardcore jugglers who just wanted the funny stuff would fast forward through this but it's so real and like my band when i was in high school my band covered this song even though it's kind of like not an appropriate song to play it you know we would play where the kind of places we'd play you know but it was a very much like a it's a great story song and at the end we wouldn't we changed the lyrics so it wasn't so obscene <laughs> but his anger at the end i agree um, dude it, and like I, I honestly think it's as far as like the lyrical standpoint it's like such it's one of icp's best songs because like it, it you know the rejection thing uh, like uh, well included but like they take it to the next level because rejection i wouldn't know like i've never been rejected by a girl like they usually like my you know icp merch and nintendo posters <laughs> i i don't know what rejection feels like as someone with taste the, the taste that i have but they they explain rejection to where I can understand it, and they also take it to the next level where um, under the like what what was a co sent, uh, source of comfort you know what I mean with Jay in jail like you'll will always be together because we're both under the moon so he could look at the moon from jail that becomes something that taunts him you know what I mean and it's like this poetic like it's just one of the most poignant things I think ICP have ever done with a song do you know what I mean totally it's a very poetic and um. Musically, it's interesting because, you know, so, okay, The Watchmen, which is, uh, we're going all over the place, Alan Moore's <laughs> famous series about the, the, the superheroes who are not good or evil. It's in the world, it was like in the 70s America where things are kind of like losing their clarity of good and evil, heroes and villains, everything is kind of relative. And this is an example of that, right? Like evil and good are relative. This dude is evil because he killed someone, but he did it for a noble cause, a chivalrous cause. Um, musically, let's talk about the chords. So we know Mike E. Clark was producing the Gangster Fun Band, which is a ska band. And the reference, the chords on this, it's a, it's a, it's a ska, it's a ska progression. But, Bop, bop, bop. So it's a reggae. It's that's because the, the the strumming's on the on the upbeat. on the upbeat. Word. So down, up, down, up, down, up. The chords are. This is crazy. Now the jugglers might have their wigs flipped. It's the same chords as Sweet Dreams, which Rhythmics played, which Marilyn Manson covered. The first where you have the minor third, which is up a semitone, and then resolves to the first note in the scale. So it's bop, bop, bop. So it's the same first two chords of that song which have this element of sweetness and sadness and so anyway musically i've always dissected this song because a lot of my um i don't know my understanding of ska and like ska and hip-hop merging comes from my appreciation of the musicality of this song so holler word man if cry. it wasn't for me holding it down my wig <laughs> would have be flipped that's what's up um what is a juggalo now this is a great song to get people in to icp i find um it has a meta moment where he, 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 he eat, eat, eat Monopoly and S out Connect Four and the song breaks and, sh and he's like, yo, what was that? He's like, don't worry about my stuff, just rap, right? The idea where you have like taking away the fourth wall where you're like the song as a song written by these guys. That's a funny moment. You mentioned that. Now, Snacks, are there any songs before this that have Juggalo in the title? I don't think so, dude. I think this is actually the first song that ICP made. Uh, with Juggalo in the title, it took four Joker's cards, uh, but it happened. Good branding. House of Horrors. So we oh, talked man. about House of Wonders, which was on Mutilation Mix and also on something else. No. Uh, yeah. It ended up on Forgotten Freshness re-release one and two. Holler. And House of Horrors is kind of like a, a different version where you have like a, a haunted house where people are tormented for their misdeeds, right? That's right. And, and uh, you know, unlike uh, Halls of Illusions, it's not as explicit what they did to deserve this torment, if anything. Um, to me, it's always kind of just been a bit more of a cartoonish, like violent song, like Boogie Woogie Woo. I don't know how much purpose it has because um, I can't think of any lyrics that like indicate something they've done wrong. But, they're uh, preppies. Yeah, they're they preppies. definitely seem on the like the preppy side, which are oftentimes a target of ICP's, uh, you know, lyrics. So that might be that might be enough right there. 
they're Karens who want to speak to the manager of the haunted house. <laughs> that's All right. right. And one of them is played by Legs Diamond. <laughs> that's what's up. Yeah, Legs Diamond kills it on this. He does. Um, uh, at the beginning, he goes, do you like excitement? Do you like Bubba? Well, you won't find that here. This is the house of horrors, right? Yeah. Um, Nell Carter, check it out. Do you like excitement? Do you like Nell Carter? And, and he goes, good. You won't find her here. Nell Carter is referenced on Intelligence and Violence by... Um, lyrical and she was a singer who was a who had her own sitcom called give me a break and this is this is going to blow your wig back brian okay. one of the actresses on give me a break her father is also my cut her father in a previous marriage then left and married my aunt and had my cousin so i have a weird connection to nell carter through my late <laughs> uncle's daughter who was on the show with Nell Carter who's referenced twice through the early years of ICP that's Dude, just a random connection that is that is random <laughs> but fresh I had no idea who Nell Carter was and I looked up I was like yo it's the woman whose show her name's Lori Hendler Lori was on anyway keep that's it moving dope. so dope. I want to tell you a story okay I want to tell you a story about the Sandman by a German author E.T.A. Hoffman and the Sandman is this idea where it was this example of romanticism in literature where they took this trope of the Sandman who is like the person who helps you fall asleep but makes it really creepy and um he, the Sandman in this story is it, it, he'll steal the eyes of children and he carries a bag dripping with bloody eyes from the kids who fall asleep without knowing he's there. He's evil. He's the boogeyman. So E.T.A. Hoffman flipped this trope of the Sandman and made it evil. Boogie Woogie Woo, I feel like very much taps into E.T.A. Hoffman's German romanticism of his uh, 19th century uh, poem, his short story from 1816. And it's the same character where like all of a sudden it's like, okay, when you fall asleep, the fantasy land that you go to could be pretty scary. And um, I also wanted to say the melody that I said was from Stomp that was also in this song is actually the one in, it's in Mad Professor. The, the kids sing a similar scale of this. Word. The boogie, woogie, woogie. But the actual synth melody was in Mad Professor. I got that confused. Sorry to the Juggalos musicologists who were confused by that. It's funny that you say that, though, because after we did that episode, I listened to Stomp, and it does kind of have that synth in the background. It's like, do, 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 do. Yeah, it's, well, it's it's the kids sing the melody, but it's not the synth line. So it's a common oh, theme throughout their records, word, word, which word. is this weird atonal, you yes. know, I, I don't know how to describe almost like it. A, yeah, almost it, like a X-Files kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Almost like, well, you know, okay, to be completely musically nerdy, I know this episode is mad long, but let's keep it moving. <laughs> the um, So the Sweet Dreams riff, right? The main riff is the one, the first note, the fourth note, and then the flatted uh, first note, sorry, the first note, fifth note, and the flatted sixth note. So the interval between the first note and the flatted sixth note is a very creepy interval that you hear in music. And it's dun, 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 so dun, dun. My, my tone is bad when I sing. That interval is used so much in ICP, so much on this album because it's beautiful, but it's also creepy. So anytime you have that weird flatted sixth interval, it's that first note to flat a six. And that's what this is melody. an example of. It's creepy. Um, okay. Then he does another, then they do another skit of the suicidal tin. He goes, don't page me. That's a nineties reference pagers yeah net and game it's about a dating game gone wrong then game speaks for itself but i did find it funny because recently on the acoustic uh concert that icb did at hollow wicket they played uh crossing thy bridge off of the wraith and talked about how that's a song that they believe they had nothing to do with it was like inspired you know i had otherworldly inspiration and then they were like this song we're about to play however <laughs> is directly from Joe and Joey and is indicative of our intelligence and creative ability and it was in the net game. I just what thought that would be worth saying. Did they have samples of it or did they have people playing the parts? So a bit of both actually. DJ Clay was spinning a backing track but it was mostly, you know, acoustic instruments. But for the voices of the characters was on the backing track? The girls. I think how they did that. I think that might have been the backing track actually. I can't remember explicitly though. That's what's up. Nedin being a Detroit slang for something. Okay. Yeah. Hallelujah. Holler. This is from the perspective of the corrupt televangelist. Mm -hmm. And um, famously, 
there was there were a lot of televangelists who came out as being corrupt. Um, they'd have a thing in his ear, and then someone would say, "Okay, go to seat seven three. Her name is Mary Williams. She lives on this street." And they'd be like, "Mary Williams, do you live on this street? Do you have a brother?" Blah blah. Because they fill out these forms about what they're suffering from, and so they make a lot of money. This was like a common thing. Let's talk about that. Snacks. Did Jesus ever take money for his healings? No, not a single time, actually. And neither did any of the apostles. You know, all the way throughout Acts. Uh, So it's a pretty, you know, non-Christian thing. Uh, A lot of people take issue with televangelists to the point of, like you said, where televangelists are so stigmatized that the word itself is indicative of like a corrupt televangelist. But there could be a televangelist who, you know, is just a evangelist on TV. Peter Popoff is the famous guy who was, yes. um, he'd received radio messages and there's great YouTube videos where like you could, someone, they, they, they figured it out because they recorded someone tapped a policeman who was, a, he was a policeman who was there in costume to record the radio conversations and sync it. So it was like clear that he was, so anyway, Absolutely. that's what's up. That's a, yeah, um, it was like, I think it was like a news, like a, you know, journalist or something went in and like kind of broke the story on that. I remember reading about that as crazy. There's a documentary about it. It's called An Honest Liar, I think. Word. Down with the clown. How long have the Juggalos been down with me? This is definitely a Juggalo anthem. 100%. And, um, yeah, and they mix a... You talk about this song. Oh, talk dude, about this song, G. Such a good song. It was probably my favorite song uh, of ICP for a long time, uh, especially right after I heard it. It was my favorite song at Malenko, for sure, for a while. And uh, just an absolute anthem, uh, just talking about, like, you know, how long will, will the Juggalos be down with me? And, you know, all the things, uh, you know, hypotheticals that uh, Valente says that asking them if the ju- asking Juggalos if they'll still be down with them. And uh, one of my favorite live music memories ever is when ICP did this at the 2011 uh, gathering to an instrumental of Centerfold by Jay Giles Band, by the Jay Giles Band. And I just remember Violet J, uh, this is just a personal memory, I just remember Violet J, like the, the music stopped and he said, we're about to have some fun. And then Centerfold played and they go into Down at the Clown and just w- literally one of my favorite memories ever. That's what's up. Well, it's like such a live, people can, people can vibe to it live. It's a Absolutely. great live song. He talks about, don't forget, it's like you did with Menudo, with <laughs> yeah. Rob Bass. So so after, so now people might be like, who the heck is Menudo? Menudo is Ricky Martin's first Puerto Rican boy band. And Rob Bass, <laughs> so that know. was the group he was in before Ricky Martin got famous. And then Rob Bass, uh, It Takes Two, right? Yes, I did know but, that. But yeah, people, Easy, somebody, DJ Easy, someone, rock, or, and Rob Bass or something. So you don't even know, right? That's like, it's so old school. It's like, we did forget them. Oh, because because they're only a few years um, before this album had come out. These were songs people knew. DJ Easy Rock, right? It takes two, right? Yeah. So, and and uh, he also says, uh, what if I had Jodeci singing all over my bleep? I mean, I didn't know who Jodeci were at the time I heard that. And I only recently learned like a year or two ago. <laughs> so it's, it's that's funny that he's like, it, the 25 years or whatever, 23 years since this came out proves the point. All right. Uh... So let's finish it just like that and pass me by. Yes, sir. Let's talk about how the album concludes with this flavor. For sure. Uh, just like that, just a song uh, really that tells like an everyday story of Violent J trying to uh, find a way to get to Shaggy to hang out and, and also, you know, go on a date with some girls. Uh, but he's having a hard time doing that. He eventually does. But while he's waiting for his ride, um, a car pulls up and he gets shot, uh, which kind of conveniently leads in to pass me, ab- pass me by, which is about dying in the afterlife. And, you know, I, I, I believe that the, the title is about not letting the good eternal destiny pass you by. And it actually contains a sample uh, from a movie called Believer's Heaven by this um, uh, uh, reverend, uh, uh, what's the name, something Perkle? Estes W. Perkle. Yes, he made two movies. The first one was about hell, which is like an hour-long film talking about the theological background of like hell, and also, but it's also like dramatized. And then he did one for heaven. Uh, and that's actually what this sample is about. I just learned that, uh, you know, six or seven months ago. That's what's up. One thing I wanted to mention before that we didn't mention real quick, in Down With The Clown, they talk about who's been down with us since Basement Cuts, since Dog Beats, and it's, they're not afraid to reference song stuff that people, because then people will seek it out, man. It's kind of brilliant in a way. I agree. It's crazy how they do that. They're like constantly referencing their own history and mythology. 
So ICP then gets signed to Island, which leads to a big, pro- the, the, the initial sales aren't huge. So they do a promotional campaign of playing the documentary of Shockumentary on uh, right after Christmas on the 30th in 97, right? And we'll talk about that. And uh, it was a million dollars to play it. And and when they played it, they're like, yeah, MTV had a disclaimer. I remember I watched it live saying, wow. we didn't want to show this, but we got paid to every year we document, we, we auction off a million dollars. This is what they decided to do with their money. That's, That's what they wild, said. And dude, I remember um, the, the voice was so sarcastic. <laughs> this is how they spent their money. <laughs> Man, yeah. I'm envious. Like, do, did you, you were obviously into ICP before that, because I know you found out about them before Malenko. So like, did you, how did you hear that it was like on? Did you see it in a TV guide or? My boy, Chris out in Michigan, uh, just email me about it. Cause Dope. he knew, cause he worked for ICP for a while. He t- used to tour with them. Cool. So he told me. And then I remember that back after Christmas break, everyone at school was, had, knew about them surprisingly. And <laughs> how, how I've kind you... of felt like, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I felt kind of like, oh, this was my secret thing. Now everyone's talking about them. <laughs> you know, but I think we've all felt like that, especially growing up with bands. Yeah. I, I remember feeling like that. Um, did, what was your parent like? Did you had to like hide it for the fact, like from your parents that you're watching it, or? That's a good point. No, they let us watch MTV back then. My sister yeah. and I were, you know, we were we watched it. I mean, it was it was you know it was during winter break, so you could be up late, right? <laughs> And watch it. They didn't like me watching Beavis and Butthead when I was in middle school. But by the time I got to high school, it was like, all right, MTVs. There's worse things. You could be on the internet looking at like much worse things by that point. So uh, snacks. When they then went on tour to promote Malenko, who opened for them? Uh, that would be Misery and House of Crazies, who uh, you know many Juggalos know was actually Twisted's old uh, group. And they had a third member in House of Crazies, name uh, the ROC. The ROC after Jamie and Paul would leave House of Crazies to sign with Psychopathic as Twisted and Most Tasteless, the original version, actually came out. That was the next Psychopathic release, which came out before Shockumentary, which is our next episode. Um, House of Crazies would then become the ROC and Scraps, who was in a group called Two Crazy Devils with Blaze Your Dead Homie. And then they would start a band called Halfbreed. Um, ROC and Scraps start Halfbreed and Serial Killers is, was their next release and I think that those two records The um, Night They Came Home which is about a reference to Halloween and Michael Myers not Wayne's World holler <laughs> and then Halfbreed those two CDs are so fresh and it's interesting I didn't realize it was the same people but that's what's up the ROC is dope and Magic Ninja Entertainment would later sign him as well as G Moski who was very pleased with the work they did for his career so Snacks where could people hear more of your music? Uh, absolutely uh, www.mcsnacks with an x dot bandcamp dot com I'm on all social media YouTube you search up MC Snacks you'll find me you do those videos where you eat all the snack weird food now <laughs> I do snacks with snacks you can check out check my that Facebook flavor out. for those I'm, I'm very up on the social media I use Facebook High Five MySpace uh, you know all the most relevant uh, media I'm on there you could catch me on Friendster <laughs> <laughs> no, that's old. Um, yeah, check it out. Follow our music if you want. We'll be back in uh, two weeks. We're doing this every other week. We'll be back in two weeks with Twisted, uh, Most Tasteless. I did an interview with George, who runs Magic Ninja Entertainment, which will be on my podcast coming up in a bit. And uh, we won't. We don't, there's been a lot of division. We don't want to get into that necessarily. We don't want to feed the negativity. But we'll talk about how ICP helped launch Twisted's career. It's just it's an interesting story. So check it out. We'll see you in two weeks. Peace. Much cloud love, y'all. Peace. Whoop! 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 See y'all later. Bye.